uh, talk today. Um, it's really a pleasure to uh, welcome Miles Kenny Lazar to, uh, to join us. He's from the uh, Department of Geography here at NUS. Um, Miles is, uh, he, uh, is going to be talking to us. I mean, his research looks at issues of uh, uh, commodification, commercialization, and, and dispossession in spaces of uh, Laos and Myanmar, and how people react to those things. And um, it uh, sounds like it's going to be a fascinating talk. Okay, so without any further ado, I'll, I'll turn things over to Miles and uh, thank you just once again, thank you for coming and joining us, Miles. Great, thanks so much for the introduction, Gerard, and for inviting me to give this talk. Let me just share my screen. All right. Yeah, so it's great to be here and to be giving this talk in Southeast Asian studies, to get to know all of you a bit better. Um, and welcome everyone to today's talk. Uh, I'll be speaking about the um, intersections of dispossession and resistance to it in the enclosure of the Tatluang Marsh or Bung Tatluang, which is one of the last remaining wetlands in Vientiane, the capital of Laos, which has been rapidly urbanizing in recent years. So this talk focuses on the development of a special economic zone or SEZ and a road crossing the marsh, as well as a lot of speculation on land that's occurring to both sides of that road and, uh, and in other areas of the wetland. So uh, you can see both of these projects in this uh, image on the title slide. So the road is kind of cutting through the middle. Obviously you can see a car driving on it. Um, and then part of the SEZ is in the background this kind of pinkish condo buildings on the left. Um, in the right hand side of the, the, the background are some other projects that are not related to this SEZ, but just showing how many of these kinds of large uh, real estate developments are ongoing. Um, in the foreground, a father and son can be seen fishing, which is a long practiced livelihood activity amongst residents of the marsh's periphery. They're now fishing in a much altered environment where there's been a great deal of dredging and re-engineering of water flow. Both projects have been pushed through by the central government and as is common in Laos, it's quite difficult for communities to resist the expropriation of their lands. But both projects have been resisted in subtle and indirect and often partial ways, working within the political limits of the possible in the Lao context. Such resistance has importantly shaped their development of these projects and also the politics of land in this locale. And in this project, we focus on the different reactions to the two types of these projects and what they say about intersections of dispossession and resistance in the Lao context, but I think it has wider implications for Southeast Asia. Um, and this is coming out of a paper that, uh, and research that I've done with Dr. Wan Jing Kelly Chen um, from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So Vieng Chen may seem like somewhat of an odd place to study urban transformation. It's not often considered in media representations and scholarship on the urban in Southeast Asia. Um, and I'm myself is not an urban scholar, I mostly work on uh, rural political ecological transformation. So it's kind of a new venture for me. Um, but Vieng Chen has always kind of been dwarfed by larger neighboring metropolises like Bangkok, Jakarta, Manila, um, but even Saigon and Phnom Penh closer by. It's long been considered to be a sleepy backwater of the region, and it's often questioned whether in fact it's even a city. So in a, a quote that comes out of a book on the transformations of Vieng Chan by Mark Askew and his colleagues, uh, he quotes a U.S. Foreign Service official writing in 1960 that Vieng Chan isn't really a national capital at all in any vital, meaningful sense of the term. Vieng Chan is merely Laos's largest town. And this really reflects the city's historical marginalization uh, geopolitically. It was once the capital of the Lao kingdom of Lansang or the kingdom of a million elephants before it was sacked by Siam in 1828 and it was depopulated and abandoned actually um, and completely grown over until Laos was annexed by France in 1893 as part of French Indochina. Now, Vientiane became the administrative capital of uh, 
of Laos, the French protectorate of Laos, but the protectorate played a relatively minor role in French Indochina, as Laos was treated more as a buffer with Siam and British Burma. During the Second Indochina War, or the American War, Vientiane received an influx of aid from the US, uh, but it only resulted in minor urban expansion. And, and very famously at that time, there was only one traffic light in the city. After the war, the Patet Lao, the communist uh, Lao political movement, retained Vientiane as the capital of the Lao People's Democratic Republic, or Lao PDR, or Laos. Um, but economic activity was pretty significantly halted by the creation of a command and control socialist economy. And the city was often described at that time as feeling shuttered or completely closed down. It was only in 1986 that the government began pursuing market liberalization following China and Vietnam's lead before them. At that time, then the city started to come back to life, markets started opening, um, and there was more going on. So by now, the city is really no longer a sleepy backwater, despite still being much smaller than other uh, Southeast Asian cities. Its population has grown from 250,000 at the beginning of the market liberalization period in 1980s to over 700,000 today. The downtown area is becoming increasingly congested with traffic. Um, you're starting to see traffic jams like this one here at the morning market or Talat Sao that you wouldn't really have seen 20 years ago. Its urban area has also doubled in area between 2000 and 2010. And much of this expansion has been at the expense of lots of smaller wetlands across the downtown area, including right next to Talat Sao here. In the mid 90s, Wetlands, floodplains, swamps, and marshes actually covered a significant extent of the city, uh, over 1,500 square kilometers. Urban development in the city has been driven by uh, infrastructure projects, certainly. Most uh, well known today being the uh, recently completed Laos China Railways, which become very popular with Lao uh, rail enthusiasts, and a new station for the railway on the outskirts of Vientiane. Uh, there's also been new uh, expressways for cars opened up recently as well. But urban expansion, especially into the wetlands, um, is particularly driven by the Lao government's policies since market liberalization in 1986, which have led up to the policy of turning land into capital. The government first began permitting the granting of large uh, state land concessions to foreign investors in 1992, but the process of doing so wasn't really clarified until 2003 with the revision of the land law. And since then, land investments have increased rapidly. In the mining and plantation sectors, over a million hectares of land concessions have been granted, which is equivalent to 5% of the national territory. So Laos is often referenced in debates over land grabbing in Southeast Asia because of these policies and these impacts, which uh, have been quite devastating. Although only so-called state land is conceded to investors, exactly what state land in the Lao context is never really clear. The government has a great deal of control over the management of the country's land, and very little land is formally allocated to private citizens. Um, and the state has wide latitude to claim large swaths of land, even though they've been customarily used by communities and households for generations. So land concessions have tended to lead to dispossession of villagers' lands across the country, leading to a loss of land and resources, impoverishment, and a general movement towards proletarianization as villagers need to supplement their livelihoods with wage labor. A lot of the research is focused on these kinds of projects in rural areas. My work particularly is focused on concessions for rubber and pulpwood plantations in, in southern Laos. Um, but there are these kinds of projects taking place in the capital as well. So around Vientiane, there's been a range of different large concessions granted, including several SEZs, like the one that we focused on this project, as well as other uh, high profile real estate projects like Latsavong Plaza, which you can see in the upper right hand corner of the uh, slide here. Um, and also it was in, that was the same building that was in the background image of the title slide. Um, this will be the tallest building uh, in Vientiane after it's completed. Another important land policy has been land titling, which has been modeled off of uh, Thai land policy policies, uh, land titling policies beforehand. 
um, and was uh, initiated with a World Bank and AusAid project in 1997. Its aim, of course, is to facilitate the growth of land markets and related economic development and growth. Um, but land titling Laos has mostly focused on urban and peri-urban areas, which is seen in the areas that can generate the greatest bang for the buck by generating the most amount of tax revenue. Um, but it's also been done in some of the larger agricultural plains, such as around Vientiane. Actually, one of the interesting things about comparing urban and uh, rural land concessions is that in urban areas like Vientiane, a lot of land is actually titled uh, to private citizens. So uh, there's some interesting differences of, of the politics of land that occur as a result. And land titling has also been conceived, especially by folks working um, in the NGO sector, as a way of strengthening land tenure and protecting people's land from expropriation. But even in Vientiane, again, where much of the land is actually titled, this land still gets granted for uh, into development projects. Um, as the land and investment laws actually allow for a broad interpretation of eminent domain in the Lao context. Um, basically, if any project can fit a general uh, criteria of being beneficial for social economic development, it can be kind of classified as a public purpose type project um, and land that's titled can be taken for it. In this case, land titles really only enable owners to gain a higher rate of compensation, although it's typically far below market rates. So this is all kind of been capped by the uh, turning land into capital policy or TLIC, which has never really been formalized or codified. Um, so it's been opened up to broad interpretation. The general idea is that it allows the government to pursue a range of different types of projects to exploit the country's land, which is framed as being underused or undeveloped um, and use it for economic development and growth, also government revenue and private profit. It actually emerges out of a de facto government strategy that's been going on since the 80s of exchanging land and resources uh, to, with the private sector for infrastructure. So there was a lot of kind of timber for road deals done with Vietnamese companies uh, in southern Laos in the 1980s to facilitate road development. Uh, it's also been interpreted to support policies of granting land concessions and also titling, which can increase the exchange value of land. And in 2019, just to, to keep note of an important uh, revision to the land law, actually permitted foreign ownership of condominium units, um, which kind of changes the, the dimensions of this SEZ development. So one of the first projects that the government referred to as a turning land into capital project involved the Tatlawang Marsh and what has been called in the media a Marsh for Stadium deal. In 2007, the Lao government granted a 50-year concession to the Chinese company Suzhou Industrial Park Overseas Investment, or Suzhou Industrial for short. And the size of this project was 1,600 hectares in a 2,000 hectare marsh, so basically a majority of it. The concession was granted for the development of a so-called modern town, which would include business centers, hotels, factories, tourism, all the fun things that you need in an SEZ. And the, con the concession was actually a de facto kind of compensation for a $100 million loan granted by the China Development Bank to the Lao government to construct the national stadium for the Southeast Asian Games or Sea Games which was held in Laos for the first time in 2009 and thus became a source of significant national pride. You can see the stadium up here on the upper right. But the legitimacy of the project was immediately questioned by the Lao public, especially middle-class residents of Vientiane. Rumors quickly spread that 50,000 Chinese families would be moving into this modern town. And there was generally a concern that the project would be turned into some sort of exclusive Chinatown walled off from the rest of the city. This was concerning to Vientiane residents, especially because it would be so close to Tat Luang, which the marsh is named after. And that's this stupa down here in the, the lower right, um, which is essentially the cultural jewel of Laos. There wasn't any direct form of protest as you typically don't see in Laos where uh, any sort of open protest can be shut down quite quickly by the government um, as it's seen as being kind of a form of anti-government protests, oftentimes 
framed as being kind of driven from uh, dissidents abroad. Um, everyone knows that, so you don't ever see it in the streets, of course. But the rumor mill of the city was in full gear, often represented by the Sapa Cafe, or what's known as the coffee assemblies of middle-aged men that like to meet at coffee shops in the morning before work to talk politics, including many who are government officials. So in response to these broad concerns, the government held a rare press conference justifying the project and uh, clarifying and, and refuting the rumors about immigration, clarifying the extent of the concession and seeking to justify its economic necessity. There were also some concerns from a nascent Lao civil society, which is small, but it's growing. It's, it's relatively limited and controlled by the government. And also sections of the international development class over the impacts of the project on the marsh and its wetlands. There had actually been earlier concerns and efforts by conservation organizations uh, to document and attempt to preserve the ecological services of the wetland, which are not surprisingly quite numerous. The marsh attenuated floods in the city and maintained water quality and supply as it can naturally treat domestic agricultural and industrial wastes as wetlands do. Um, it was also used by residents living along the edges of it for double season paddy rice farming as during the dry season uh, water could actually be pumped out from the center of the, the marsh. Um, it was used for fishing, for foraging, for snails, crabs, and naturally growing water vegetables. And at one point, uh, very interestingly, the representative of the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO, got involved and developed a counter proposal to conserve the marsh, which would include developing raised boardwalks, viewing sites, and educational signs that would turn it into kind of a site of, of leisure and, and education, which in general, it was not a bad idea, um, but the proposal was ignored partly, of course, because it didn't bring in much money or development, but also because there was a plan included in it to actually develop a new UN office on the wetland on, on uh, floating pontoons that would make it supposedly sustainable and ecologically sensitive. But in my view, I think it came off as being a little bit self-serving and probably didn't help the proposal. So in 2010, Suzhou Industrial actually pulled out of the project in part because of these controversies, but also because of the increasingly high costs of land compensation that they would have had to, to pay off. And they were granted a different plot of land closer to the Sea Games Stadium, which is about 16 kilometers outside the city, quite a bit further out. And it seemed for a short period that the wetland might be spared from enclosure, at least from this project but the idea of the project lived on. And in 2011, the Lao government granted a new concession to Wan Feng Shanghai Real Estate uh, Company, which I'll just refer to as Wan Feng Company, to develop a $1.5 billion project, which had a lot of the same uh, amenities, luxury condominiums, hotels, shopping centers, and a publicly accessible lake. So a lot more focused on real estate, no uh, industrial development, um, and you can, see the artist's rendition of this. This is early on, of course, um, of, of what this would look like. Of course, there's nothing of Yangchen in the background. I mean, it doesn't, it's not this kind of verdant landscape. A lot of this is very built up, of course. Um, but what was kind of interesting is that there were a lot of important changes to the project to appease the earlier concerns of the public. So it would be much smaller, for instance, only 365 hectares instead of 1,600. Um, and this is reflected in the, its designation as a quote unquote specific economic zone rather than a special one, which actually is a legal designation that for projects that are less than 1000 hectares and also those that are restricted to uh, specific activities like real estate development rather than a wider range of uses, including industrial projects. It was also purposely designed to be more open to the public. The lake was there for the public, um, but also a night market and dragon boat racing during the annual boat racing festival at the end of October um, and shopping centers. So in addition, anyone could buy the condos uh, regardless of nationality, especially now that that legal uh, issue has been clarified in the latest land law. <clears throat> 
Notably, the SEZ uses the term lake instead of marsh or wetland in its name. And this is partly in reference to this lake in the middle, this man-made lake um, or lagoon that they've developed, uh, but also because a lake probably sounds a little bit more inviting as a site of um, recreation for the upper and middle classes of, of Vientiane. Um, so partly also appealing to those concerns that they initially had. Um, and just, you know, this is a, a map that we've had done uh, by our cartographer um, that shows the location within of, of the boundaries of the zone within the Tatlong Marsh. Um, and also we'll be talking about this road in just a bit. And this is the entrance to the SEZ. And I just put this up here because interestingly, there was a gate here before and has been replaced with these two large columns, which are thought to be more inviting to the public. Um, I'm not sure if I feel the same way. They are kind of intimidating, I think, but it is completely open. And, you know, we 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 experienced that from being able to come in and out as much as we wanted to, to check out the, the zone. So despite the beautiful imagery in the artist's rendition of this SEZ, the reality, not surprisingly, is quite different. Um, and some of these images are coming from the latest of 2018. So there have been some changes since then, which I'll mention. Um, but at that time, which was when we completed this research, the condos weren't all completed. Only two of the buildings had residents. All the other buildings that you saw in the artist rendition are not there. These are the only kind of actual buildings in the zone at that point. Um, so that was partly due to their high price, but also at that time, unclear ownership for foreigners. Um, obviously that's been clarified now. So that's, that will obviously create some more interest in the condos. Um, but most of the rest of the SEZ wasn't developed because it was the, the developer was having a hard time attracting other investors to develop the shopping malls, entertainment venues, and hotels. And one thing was just really the developer of the SEZ and, and was trying to recruit a range of different investors to, to build the rest. So at that point, the developer, one thing was really struggling. Um, and you could see this kind of mixing of the zone with these previous land uses and livelihoods. Villagers continued to raise cattle within the concession area, even though they'd every once in a while be threatened with fines for doing so. There were even uh, goats roaming through on the roads. Uh, the project looked pretty awful in a lot of ways. The infrastructure was incomplete. It was poor quality. There are cracks appearing in the unfinished roads. This has changed by this point, and even in later trips, I did see that you know the roads have been fixed up um, and, and connected, um, and there's more investors coming in. Condos are selling a little better. The One Fung has recently signed a deal with a Korean real estate company to develop the zone further. So I'm sure some of this will change, but I think a lot of the underlying problems still generally remain the same. So let me talk, just step back and talk a bit about this research project and how it uh, developed over time. So we started off researching the Tatluang SEZ, um, partly because it's a well-known project of dispossession. We wanted to understand how the dynamics of resistance had changed between that earlier kind of public outcry and controversy of the original project and the development of the new one. But as we were conducting field work, it became increasingly apparent that the SEZ was not the only driver and maybe not even the main one of enclosure in the wetland. As important were other infrastructural projects, especially the development of a speculative land market that sparked the beginning of land filling and urban construction, starting from the edges of the wetland and encroaching inward. So just to the south of the SEZ, it was quickly apparent that this road, which is called the Namta Road that crosses the wetland to ease congestion in the city, um, was actually generating a huge amount of enclosure itself. Um, and was becoming increasingly problematic and leading to a, a certain degree of resistance from residents. So this road, uh, the developer had actually been given the rights to expropriate land 200 meters to each side of it that they could then sell off at speculative rates. So you can imagine this is not making landowners very happy. And then outside of this zone, other landowners were selling off their land as prices increased. Um, so there was a broader form of enclosure taking place. And there was this kind of emerging movement of landowners contesting, especially the illegalities surrounding um, the speculation on this road. So we saw an interesting opportunity for comparing dynamics of dispossession and resistance across these two projects. 
We conducted our research intermittently between 2016 and 2018. Uh, Kelly actually carried out most of the field work um, and I was able to join for about a period of, of, of six weeks on several different trips. Um, we conducted interviews with a range of different actors, lab government officials, developer representatives, land brokers, village chiefs, residents of the wetland. We were particularly focused on villages on the eastern side of the wetland here, um, where more of the contentious land politics were taking place. We also engaged in participant observation, walking through this transforming wetland landscape with residents, joining them in meals uh, made from the diminishing products that can be collected and harvested, like these very tasty snails um, that come from the wetland. Um, and just generally kind of relaxing across uh, the, the edges of the wetland with residents in shady spots during the, the heat of the day. And of course, we were collecting official documents and maps related to the two projects as they were available. So back to the SEZ, one of the really important things that happened with this project, um, besides enclosure in the sense of creating the boundaries of the zone, was a process of uh, dredging and drainage that uh, enabled development of property throughout this area and actually is kind of the key driver of enclosure that was enabled in the other areas, including next to that road. So of course, um, basically what happened is that there's knowledge, of course, uh, amongst the government and also the developer that Flooding could be an incredibly important problem if they start filling in all of this land. And so because this actually uh, contains flow of water that comes from the Mekong and then goes through uh, the wetland and through a series of rivers back up to another part of the Mekong, um, actually it's very important to retain that flow in one way or another. Um, but they also want to develop this land. So what they did is that they actually started dredging a canal in the middle of the wetland. So you could still have this water flowing through um, that it could absorb, ideally for them to absorb extra water during rainy periods um, during the wet season. And at the same time that this would allow them to kind of drain out the land to the side of those, that, that canal. So you can kind of, you can see it here. Um, I think I have another image um, back up here further. Yeah, so you can see this is, in this satellite image, you can see how much of this has been developed. You can also see that already see the shape of the zone here. And this is the kind of canal that was dredged right in the middle of the marsh. Um, and so then all of this land to the side can basically be drained out and it can be filled in and it can be turned into plots of land for different types of real estate projects. So this is, um, you know, quite, disastrous, even though this is beneficial for property development, you might already see that how kind of disastrous this can be for the socioecologies of this area and especially people's relationships to uh, the environment, um, especially those who you know are not intending to kind of cash in on the increased land values or those who don't have land title in this area um, and are benefiting from different types of activities, whether it's fishing or collecting crabs or, or collecting snails as this guy was doing. Um, double season paddy farming is no longer possible because it's much harder to pump out water from this canal. Um, so they can only do rice farming during the wet season. Um, it's still much harder to control the flow of water because of the ways in which this landscape has been changed. There are many, much fewer areas for fishing and collecting other products. Um, and all these areas are also kind of heavily damaged and possibly also heavily polluted as well. Something I try not to think about while we're having that snail dish. Um, most of the remaining areas for subsistence livelihoods for fishing um, and collecting snails is mostly in the southern part of this wetland area now. So the earlier controversy surrounding the so-called Marsh for Stadium deal might have changed the character of the SEZ that was actually approved, but it didn't really have much of an effect upon the politics of land amongst wetland residents. Many of them were actually not well aware of the earlier controversy, which demonstrates a class divide between those who were concerned about it, which is kind of a, a broader middle class of 
urban residents across Vientian um, compared to uh, wetland users, um, their concerns are more with their kind of immediate access and use of land. Um, and those earlier concerns from the public basically dissipated when the project was scaled down and opened up to the public. Actually, many residents of Yangchen were excited about the prospects of this new development that they could visit. Um, they could hang out around this so-called lake. They were really hardly concerned about the dispossession of Yangchen residents uh, land of wetland residents land, partly because this has become somewhat of a normalized element of development uh, in the city. But the residents, of course, were very wary about parting ways with their land for the project, uh, because obviously it's their most important, if not only, substantial asset. The government engaged in a very aggressive campaign to convince them to acquiesce. They emphasized that this was a project of national importance approved by the central government and how the project would lead to modern economic development, bringing new shopping centers so that people no longer have to travel to Thailand to buy cheap goods at the malls there, which is common practice amongst Vientiane citizens on the weekends. But again, this is hardly a concern, less of a concern amongst wetland residents as it is amongst uh, middle-class citizens of the city. Moreover, villagers were told that they had no choice in the matter, that if they wanted to get compensation for their land, then they had to hand in their land titles or their land use certificates. Some villagers wrote complaint letters to the National Assembly and a meeting was eventually held at which assembly members told them that the problems with the Tatluang SEZ have already been solved and it's over now. Eventually, this kind of limited political reaction from wetland residents died down and they started to accept that probably their energy was better spent uh, not protesting against dispossession, but on getting the best compensation for their land possible. As one resident reflected in an interview, although I disagree, I cannot resist. This focus on compensation is a reflection of what Eric Harms has called the atomized descent that can occur when you have urban development projects, his research focusing on those in Saigon and Vietnam, when collective concerns become, they kind of dissipate to become individual concerns that are focusing on the value of individual plots of land, measuring them um, and kind of squabbles over compensation. The compensation process itself ended up becoming very messy in a site of the politics of land. There was a great deal of discontent um, and it became much more political than the original act of dispossession. As is common with development projects in Laos, the developer, Wan Feng, handed over some of money to the government that would be used for compensation. The government was responsible for doling it out. There were, of course, a range of inconsistencies taking place that led affected landowners to increasingly believe that government officials were lowering compensation rates and skimming the rest off the top. There wasn't really any transparency about how compensation rates were determined, especially in relationship to the size of the overall compensation fund. Originally, for example, those with land titles were actually supposed to receive a higher rate of compensation but ultimately it was decided that they would just create two zones, one that's closer to the road and one that's in the center of the wetland and higher compensation would be given to land nearer to the road because it's supposedly of higher economic value. Additionally, landowners with the same types of land sometimes uh, received different compensation rates um, with no explanation. And so that raised questions about who is getting what and why there were assumptions that maybe some who had better connections to government officials were able to negotiate for a higher compensation. One family was even told that they had been given too much money for compensation by mistake, and they were asked to return a significant portion of it if they wanted to get back their land title, which would be a revised version of the land title because part of it was still outside of the concession area. One woman even recounted that she had refused to collect the compensation multiple times because she was disappointed with that low rate. And actually refusing compensation can be kind of a last stitch effort to resist this process uh, because the compensation process actually needs to be completed in order for the land development to continue on. Um, landowners though oftentimes use it as a kind of strategy for gaining a higher compensation rate. So now I wanna move on and talk about the road and, and we can start to see some of the comparative elements of dispossession um, and reactions to it that are occurring here. 
So this road project known as the Namta Road because it was constructed by the Namta Bridge Construction Road and Bridge Construction Company was under consideration since 2008 when land was being surveyed for its construction. Construction began on the project in 2012. And I should mention that 40% of the project is owned by the Lao government. To fund it, a model was used that had previously been developed for another turning land into capital project known as the 450 year road, which is a ring road in the outer outskirts of Vientiane, further out from this. Um, and in that project, the government expropriated 50 meters of land to each side at low compensation rates and then resold it at higher inflated rates um, to fund the construction of the road. And basically, even though this is hotly contested at the time, um, it was seen as a successful model for funding infrastructural development as a turning land into capital project. So for this road, the company was allowed to acquire four times that amount of land each side, with up to 200 meters on each side, which is a huge amount of land and much larger than the size of the road. They compensated land at low prices, which averaged around 47 US dollars per square meter, not a small amount, but still they were selling it on the market or attempting to at three to $400 per square meter. Company staff, government officials, and land brokers were aggressively pushing landowners to give up their land. And even before the company had final approval to do this, they had already started intimidating villagers into selling their land at low prices in order to quickly mop it up and prevent later conflicts. And they would oftentimes threaten villagers that if they didn't give up their land, sell it, then they might not get anything at all or even much less. However, the company didn't even follow these restrictions of expropriating land within the 200 meters. They tended to see this boundary as more of a suggestion um, rather than a hard rule, and they started acquiring land far beyond it. So you can actually see this in this map that the, a land broker that uh, we had interviewed allowed us to take a picture of. Um, and basically what it shows is all the plots of land around the road. You can see the road here kind of snaking through these blue lines and the 200 meter boundary is here in red, a little bit faint. Um, you can see it on the other side here. And basically all of these plots that are in uh, green um, or salmon colored have already been acquired and compensated. And you can see a lot of these green plots extending far beyond the boundary of this 200 meters. Um, and the land broker was very actually honest about this um, and noted to us in an interview that a company can go beyond that line into unused area to get enough land until the land value equals the cost of road construction, which um, probably is not actually legally the case, um, but maybe something we need to look into a little bit further, whether there's any language like that in the contract. Then the plots in white and light brown that you can kind of see throughout this uh, map have not been compensated yet, which means that the owners, for the most part, are refusing compensation. And so it demonstrates that there's actually a decent number of landholders that are refusing to give up their land, whether in an attempt to permanently hold on to it um, or to hold out for a higher compensation rate. In some cases, they've even sought to sell their land to wealthier buyers uh, who are willing to put up a fight with the project owner to hold on to the land. And oftentimes there tend to be wealthier landowners who had multiple plots of land um, or other sources of income. So they could kind of take a risk with trying to hold on to their land. Um, and if it got taken, it wouldn't be as big of a loss or as important or significant of one as it would be for those who only have one plot of land that's already targeted. There was even greater resistance to this project uh, brewing in the areas outside of the 200 meter zone where villagers were learning the company was illegally acquiring land, often bribing village chiefs to intimidate villagers into selling at low prices. One of the village chiefs was even enrolled to freeze land transactions in the village, not allowing villagers to sell land at all unless they were selling it to Namta company. And villagers started collectively strategizing how to respond. A retired uh, military officer from the area, and actually it's worth noting that many who fought for the Patat Lao during the war were allocated land in this area after 1975 by the government. So there are some actually some well-connected families, which allows for some of these kind of uh, activity to, to occur with a bit more confidence, you could say. 
this military officer, he put uh, these um, villagers in touch with a pro bono law firm that started advising them to refuse any compensation money from the company. The law firm also helped them to write complaint letters to the National Assembly and to the Vientiane Capital Governor's Office. And this is kind of a common mode of resistance is kind of working within the state, um, trying not to present your actions as being anti-government um, so that they're not kind of, uh, there's no strong political reaction against them, but rather to kind of work within the system, but still try to put up some front of, of, of resistance. Ultimately, uh, the government offices, uh, the assembly and the, the governor's office didn't intervene, but the lawyer noted to us that the company had become much more cautious in its land acquisition processes. And ultimately, what was one of the interesting results of this is that it started to lead to kind of a group of households um, and supposedly over 200 households started resisting expropriation of their land in this broader area around the marsh, not only for this project, um, but for other projects like it. Um, so there was a kind of incipient movement developing of sorts, but one that was very much underground um, because they need to be careful not to be seen as being some sort of anti-government uh, land movement. So here I just want to take some time to reflect upon some of the kind of uh, comparative elements of, of looking at the politics of, of land across this urbanizing wetland and between and, and across these two different projects. So I think it's, they're quite interesting and insightful to compare um, both in their strategies and practices of dispossession, but also in the different forms of resistance and land politics that they've sparked. So the dispossession associated with the SEZ was ultimately, it was contested partly at first, but it was ultimately accepted as inevitable um, and the land politics became atomized uh, concerned only with increasing the price of compensation in relationship to the value of the land as much as possible. In contrast, the dispossession generated by this road and all the land acquisition and speculation to the side of it was increasingly contested as the project went on, as landowners started figuring out what's going on um, and it increasingly led to a collective movement, but within the uh, very strong limits upon social movement politics in Laos. On the one hand, there's kind of a temporal element to the changing dynamics of resistance. Um, and you can see this with some residents that were affected, their land was affected by both projects uh, and their comments reflect this kind of changing attitude over time. So one said that uh, Mung Jin, which means Chinatown, actually this is kind of a shorthand of how people in the wetland refer to the project, even though it's definitely not supposed to look like a, or be a Chinatown in any way. They still call it that, uh, that it's already happened and it's too late to do something now. And then when Meng Jin was, came, I was honest and not smart compared to now being a little bit more savvy about the kind of land politics that they engage in in relationship to the road or any other projects and unscrupulous land investors that might come along. More importantly, there's a different perception of legitimacy for both projects. The SEZ of course had the weight of a national project for quote unquote development, even though that development might be superficial and elusive, especially because it hasn't fully manifested. And, and the most Ill illegitimate part of the project was really the compensation process. Um, and a lot of blame was placed on government officials rather than the company for those problems. The Namta project, apart from the road, was seen as being purely speculative. As one resident said to us, what Namta did was not development. They took our land and resell it every day at a really high price in dollars. It's land speculation, not development. There are also really important spatial differences. I should mention that as uh, I'm a geographer in the projects um, that shaped different dynamics of resistance. So the SEZ was territorially bounded in ways that the road wasn't. The borders of the project were quickly established and the material, materiality of the land within them and also on the edges and outside the project was transformed quite dramatically. The land was clearly no longer the same. It was turned into an SEZ, into infrastructure, into condos, et cetera. Um, it was clearly in the hands of the developer and looked nothing like it did before. So it was very clear that this kind of 
process of dispossession was complete and the only kind of politics remaining were those on compensation. The Namta Road, in contrast, was not territorially bounded. The boundaries of the project weren't transparent at all. Um, most people didn't know about this 200 meters and the project kept that, the company kept that quiet because they wanted to use the kind of confusion around the project to intimidate villagers into giving up their land. Um, and importantly, the land was just so obviously being used for speculation. It's something that's happening throughout the city with the development of land markets. Everyone, all landowners are in, involved in some degree of speculation, whether big or small. Um, and landowners themselves could have been doing the same thing if they had been able to hold on to their assets. They would have been able to hold on to it and be able to profit from increasing land values. So it's quite obvious um, what's going on and what they're missing out on. Resistance to both projects is kind of following an increasingly common script in Laos, making these complaints to the government rather than contesting the project outright, but rather to try to contest the problems, the illegalities or injustices, and to kind of negotiate around the edges in order to lessen the impact on their livelihoods. Um, in previous work, I referred to this as resisting with the state as they're expressing their discontent within the political boundaries set by the state. What's interesting, though, is it's becoming increasingly difficult to dispossess landowners across the country, and this is recognized by government officials even, and particularly in Vientiane, where land values are higher and people do have uh, title to their land, even if it doesn't prevent displacement. And this is becoming increasingly the case when projects are viewed as illegitimate and landowners are increasingly asserting and claiming their land rights. On a more conceptual note, I think it's uh, important for thinking about dispossession and resistance together, that you can understand the types of resistance that are emerging and why when you pay closer attention to the spatial and temporal dynamics of the project and its, its mode of dispossession. And I think this is gonna become increasingly important in Laos as the government continues to grant concessions for urban development projects. Um, there recently was an announcement of the development of a, a large uh, smart city on the outskirts of Vientiane. Um, so there, there's always kind of these, these heated land politics occurring. So I'll end the talk there um, so that we have plenty of time for discussion. And thank you all for listening in. That's, that's great, Miles. Thanks for that really uh, sort of for, for complicating this uh, picture of dispossession and resistance in urban settings. Um, so 